I'm still kind of um, in the, the same mode um, from last week. Um, thinking about the human body, unity, diversity in the body, um, what that means for the concepts that Jesus kind of spells out for us. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, I'll kind of read this again and have some thoughts. Just, the bo- just as the body through one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we're all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we're all given one spirit to drink. So in other words, we're part of the same body. It doesn't matter our socioeconomic makeup. It doesn't matter our physical appearances. It doesn't matter our station in society, our level of schooling, our intellect. We're all part of this body. And then verse 14, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So if the foot should say, because I am not hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And it goes on to list a bunch of things, you know, but the eye, what if the eye said to the foot, I don't need you, or the foot said to the hand, I don't need you anymore. We all work in conjunction with each other. And I got to thinking about the thing that holds the body together. What holds everything together? What allows for movement of our muscles and our ligaments? What, what creates the possibility for movement for being able to to work and to move and to have our being, it's our bones. And even to live, it's our bones. It's the perfect structure that God created. It's the perfect amount of density, of hardness. If the collagen lessens or, or, or is more, then it's too hard or it's too pliable and doesn't move. There's no other substance that scientists have been able to find that would actually work better than a human bone. It holds everything together. It allows movement. Without a, without a bone in your arm, you actually can't move these muscles. You need that triangular shape here to be able to have something to work off of. And so it is with the body of Christ, but so is it. And what, what, what are the bones inside of, like, just say, the, the structure of uh, who we are as Christians? It's the word of God. That's that's the bone. That's kind of the rigid part, but it's it's not too rigid. And it's not too pliable. It's just the perfect amount that allows us to live in freedom. So when I say a hard substance like a bone that can't bend actually limits us from sleeping better because our bones don't contort to the shape of, of where we're laying. But actually, our bone structure and what it actually is provides us with freedom instead. Allows us to run and jump and ski and to do those kind of things. An amazing thing that what does the bones do in the very middle of it? So you have this hard surface that holds our body together, allows movement. But in the very center of it, over one trillion new blood cells are created every single day. It is the life to all of our organs. It is the oxygen that we're breathing. The Bible says it provides life to us. Bones provide our life. And right running down the center of the word of God, which holds everything together, is this new bloodline that is being produced. His grace is always there. His mercies are are renewed every single morning, just like our our blood is being replaced and rebuilt and replenished. His grace is being renewed and replenished and created, and his mercies are there, and it never runs out. This little structure, now listen to this. When I'm thinking about bones and rigidity and some of this stuff that allows our bodies to move, our spiritual being, just me individually, my spiritual being to move, but also the body of Christ, the the greater body to move, what works for me works for 
the body. And as I look at these laws, and some people will view the, the law of God as a very restrictive measure. Like if it wasn't there, we'd be able to live in freedom. But the truth is, it's perfect. It's completely 100% perfect. And without it, we actually don't live and move and have our, bre- our being. This is the importance of the word of God. Look back in Exodus chapter 20, where these first 10 commandments are given. These are commandments, and they have a negative connotation, a lot of them do. You shall not make, you shall not misuse, you know, right? All these, you shall not steal, you shall not. And it feels very restrictive, but the truth is, there's actually more freedom in a negative comment, a a negative law, than a positive one. What's more free? You can eat from any tree in the garden except that one. Or, I tell you what, I want you to eat from every single tree. Start at the back corner, work your way around the perimeter, perimeter, do it in order. You can eat from all of them, but you got to do it in a specific way. That's a positive comment, but it's more restrictive. What if you read these Ten Commandments in a way that was a love letter to your soul? I am the Lord your God. What if you read it as, I accept you right where you are right now? Before I give you any of these commandments, I love you. I accept you. I want you. My, and this, this is the foundation of who we are as Christians. The foundation. Yeah, but that's the Ten Commandments, Sean. Yeah, it's the foundation. And God, right from the beginning, I love you. You are my children. I am your God. I want to be possessive of you. I I jealously long after the spirit I placed inside of you. And I want you to live in abundance and and in freedom. My desire is that you live a full life. Would, Would you come and live inside of me so that I can give you freedom? Listen, what happens to grass when it's planted in the ground? It grows. Because its foundation is rooted there. But what if you plucked out the grass and away from its foundation, away from its roots, and the grass said, no, I want to live on my own apart from the ground. It's going to die and wither because it's not plugged into the foundation anymore. And people want their freedom at the same time. They start to experience a death inside of their soul and they don't know what happens, how it happens. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery where you once were what? You were slaves to sin. You were slaves to failure. You were slaves apart from the master's household. But I'm bringing you in. And I'm your God. And you're my people. You shall have no other gods before me. At, the, at which point we should see, yeah, you're good. Yeah, you, you're no, no brainer, God. Yeah, I don't want any other gods before you. You are perfect and holy. You should not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or on earth, beneath or in the waters. You should not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for their sin, the parents of the third and fourth generation. Okay, so, so how is this a positive thing? You shall not. Make for yourself an image. What is God saying here? I want to be enough for you. I'm already enough. Will you accept everything that I have to offer? Don't go somewhere else where I have the perfect gift. I have the abundance. I am your shepherd. I am your healer. I am everywhere. I am your righteousness. I am your banner. I'm your sanctifier. I'm your peace. I'm your provider. That's what God's saying here. Don't go to some other counterfeit to get the thing that I can give you the original. Don't do it. And why? Because I want to be in control and you shall worship me. No, because I want you to live in the truest form of freedom and I want you to live the truest kind of life. That's what God's saying here. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. What's this? Why, why not misuse his name? I think it, goes without saying but you cannot both misuse somebody's name and love them wholly the bible says it says what if your heart condemns you 
like you don't have confidence in God. If you want the truest kind of faith and the greatest connection with him, then guess what? Your heart needs to be pure. And it's not him saying, if your heart's not pure, we can't connect. God's saying, no, if, if your heart condemns you, then it ruins our relationship. And I, don't, I want to spend time with you. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. We, we know this one. <laughs> right? Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. No work on the seventh day. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said later on in the New Testament, he said, the Sabbath was made for man. Jesus said this. Not the man for the Sabbath. What does this mean? Like we weren't created for the purpose of taking a Sabbath. The Sabbath was created for us so we could have rest. It's God saying this, like, look, you need one day where you are resting and you allow me to fill you up again. This is a law, and actually this is one of the strictest laws in all of the Jewish laws. In other words, in in the old time, in in the Jewish way of viewing things, if you had a scale, a perfectly balanced scale, the Sabbath would be on one side of the scale and the other nine commandments, including murder, and adultery and stealing and using the Lord's name in vain is on the other side and they even out. This is how important the Sabbath is. You take one day out of your week and say, God, it's yours. Nothing else will supersede it. Nothing will supersede it. God, this is your day. And why did he do that? Because he knew we needed it. (laughs) Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's Jesus' words. You shall not murder. And we see these laws even taken to further degree when Jesus comes on the scene. And if you call someone an idiot, if you say raka to your brother, it's the same as murdering him. What's he saying? If you're all my children, I want my kids to get along. You better find a way to not murder each other, like physically, but with your words as well. God's saying, look, I love you so much. What was Jesus' last prayer? I think Faith's going to talk about this. Pastor Faith's going to talk about this a little bit in the second service. What's Jesus' prayer? That they would would be one as, in, in you as I am one with you, Father, that they would have that same kind of thing, that there would be unity. And he goes so far as to say this. He says, how will they know that they're followers of Jesus by their love for one another is how they're going to know. You shall not commit adultery. We can all agree that's a, that's a good commandment. But what's he, what's he really saying here with these last six? The first four are all about God. These last ones are, these commandments are for us. Do you want to live the fullest kind of life? Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't. These these are protect our souls, our hearts. Don't don't do something to somebody else that didn't deserve it. Care more about others than you do about yourself. Don't steal. Don't take. They're all the same thing. Murder is taking someone's life. Adultery is taking someone's value. Stealing is taking someone's possessions. You shall not commit false testimony against your your neighbor. It's taking someone's character. Don't covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servants for his ox or his donkey. I've never been tempted to take my neighbor's ox. I can say that one. Or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. It's no wonder, and they want to take these Ten Commandments down, but there's no wonder these are in our Supreme Court. If we did these ten things, there's no issues. Zero. There's nothing from murder to tax evasion to drug dealing. There's, There's nothing. This is God, this is the foundation. So I'm saying these are very, very rigid in the beginning, but what's he saying? What did Jesus say? You take all those in the 613 odd, odd, you know, 
promise, uh, command, commands that are you found in the Old Testament, in all of the iterations of every single command, you lump them all, and he says this, you know what, just love each other as I have loved you. That's it. Just love. What did Paul say? <laughs> he said, the only thing that counts in Galatians, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So what is this? It's the most rigid of foundations that we can have with the most amount of pliability that allows us to run and jump and be free at the same time. This is the word of God. Check this out. I'm going to read one more scripture and I'll be done. Um, Proverbs. You guys know this one. Proverbs chapter 3. My son, don't forget my teaching. Keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong, prolong your life in many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And you'll win favor and a good name in the sight of man and God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean on to your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And listen, what all this does, it brings health to your body and nourishment to your bones. it's all connected I just want to encourage you guys this morning this word of God is for you as we enter these times and what is going on right now in culture where there is no truth or everyone lives according to their own truths if you if your bones live that way we would not be able to stand you need a truth to be able to stand. There's got to be something that holds everything together and allows it to move. But once you start saying, you know what? Inject, <laughs> inject my bones with hydrochloric acid. What's it do? It makes your bones rubbery. You can't stand. You can't move. You can't build muscle. You can't do anything but lay there. Guys, in this time, and where we're at as a nation, politically, racially, economically, now is when we need this book. This is the thing that we're allowed to stand on. And when we stand on this, we shall not falter because it is the foundation of everything that we are. It is the foundation of the world. It's the foundation of this government. It's the foundation of everything it was built on. Do not let this get out of your sight. Because it does what? <laughs> it, 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 gives, it gives law and rigidity a little bit, but it allows the greatest amount of flexibility and freedom at the same time. You want to be free in your life, and you want this nation to be free. This is what it's built on. If there's any time to stand up, for what we believe in what this book says. Now listen, you cannot agree with your bones all day long. <laughs> but they are what they are. They're still going to produce that, that, that one trillion new blood cells. They're still going to allow your, your, your muscles to move. And they're still going to exist when you're gone. The skeletons are three, four, five, six hundred years old. They're still being studied. And you could try to tell God he didn't deserve a place in your life. You could try and tell God he didn't deserve a place in this country. You could try, try and kick him out of our homes. But guess what? We've got a choice. He will still be here a trillion years from now because he is the foundation of everything. 
You've got a decision to make. Do you want to hold on to that foundation? Or grab on to something that will be washed away with the next hurricane? This is not about whether we want to try and bend this thing to match up with our belief structure because we want to hold on to our beliefs so bad. No, it's, it's this first. And God, you are my God. I will put no other gods before you. What are you saying to me? I will build my foundation off this. If I build it off myself, what, what good is it? I'm not planning to get political this morning, but there you go. When we're voting, when we're setting up our, our, our political views, this is the foundation. It's the only way that it actually works. We can try to morph it to society. And listen, it has never worked. You can go 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years back and trace it. It has never worked. You got anything? <laughs> Thank you. Good word. It's powerful. Makes me want to sing. <laughs> All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Let's sing it out. Great. Who is so great? Are you? truth and building our lives on the truth, I just feel in my spirit that God is speaking to some of you and ministering and, and you just feel really crippled. You know, as Pastor Sean was sharing about the bones and being held together, some of you feel crippled, crippled by maybe a lie, crippled by fear, maybe crippled by something physical, crippled by your past. <laughs> the awesome thing, the awesome thing about God is that in, in this gift, this truth, this amazing gift of our Savior, he is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, <laughs> and I am the truth, and I am the life. <laughs> and like Pastor Sean said, you know, he addressed the heart. He addressed the heart. And when we really think about how we love and overlooking offenses and covering one another, the Bible says that love covers a multitude of offenses, a multitude of sin. We all miss it. But love and the truth will always counter, will always counter the lie, will always trump the lie. Will always, always drive out fear. Perfect love drives out fear. You know, as I was on the plane, and a lot of you know I flew to Texas to visit my family. And I just love to write songs. I love to write prayers unto God. And there was just, I was just looking out at the clouds. I was looking out at the sky and it's just in awe, just in awe of God's love and awe of his goodness and awe of his grace. And this prayer came up in my spirit. Who is like our God? <laughs> so full is his wonder and majesty, holiness no one can understand. Who is like our God? 
perfect in splendor and more powerful than a trillion enemies. Who is like our God? Nothing can compare. No one stands a chance in comparison to his glory. Who is like our God? He is mighty. He is perfect. He is wondrous. I stand in awe of his greatness. I am not. I am not worthy. I cannot stand in his presence without his righteousness. I bow my whole life to him in repentance. I am sinful and he is sinless. I am broken and he makes me whole again and again and again. Who is like our God? He is mercy and I am desperate for it. He is love and my soul longs to know him in a deeper way. Who is like our God? You are my salvation, full of compassion. I do not deserve. Thank you, almighty God, for you have chosen me. Who am I to deserve such favor and redemption? Who is like our God? You are God, King of kings, Lord of lords. Yes, you are. The whole world will bow to you and confess you are king. You are God, name above every name. I will forever declare your salvation. Who is like our God? Who is like our God? So powerful, so mighty. There's nothing like our God. You know, as Pastor Sean was saying, you know, when we, when we look at the commandments and we look at all that he has told us, you know, I consider the word of God an instruction manual, a manual for life. And I've never regretted applying his word, not just reading his word. It's not just about knowing it. It's about living it and applying it. He is so good. He's so good. I've never, ever, ever, ever been disappointed when I meditate, when I meditate on the word of God. You know, because just like you were sharing, Pastor Sean, until we really read it, until we understand it, until we know it, you know, the Bible says that people perish, people die. People lose hope, right? With a lack of what? Knowledge. They perish with a lack of knowledge, with a lack of vision. Well, you need to know this morning the greatness of a God that loves you, loves you unconditionally, even when you disagree with him, (laughs) even when you disappoint him, even when you're sinful. God loves you, like Pastor Sean said, before he ever gave the Ten Commandments. He said, I am the Lord your God. (laughs) He already chose you. I love Psalm 112, 7 through 8. This is talking about us, those of us that have accepted that we are sinners, accepted the amazing gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. They, they will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. And in the end, they will look in triumph on their enemies. They will have no fear of bad news. See, the more that we know the truth, the more that we know the goodness of God and his his grace and his love, and, and we know how forgiven we are, we can forgive. And we know that God wants to heal us and we can give that healing away. We know that God wants to fill our hearts with hope. We can give that hope away. And we don't run to him condemned, right? Like Pastor Sean said, it's one of my favorite scriptures. When a man's heart is condemned, he has no confidence in God. And the devil wants to accuse you. He's described in the scriptures as the accuser of the brethren. He loves to come and condemn you and accuse you of your past and of your sin. But we can run to the Father. We can fall into grace. Are you tired of hiding? Do you need a surgeon this morning? God is your heart surgeon. Do you need a friend? Oh, he's the greatest friend I've ever had. He's the most faithful friend you'll ever, ever have because he's he's perfect. He's perfect. He cannot fail. He cannot fail you. (laughs) So hold on to him this morning. Hold on to his faithfulness. That's good. That's really good. When Pastor Sean was talking about at the beginning of all this, just talking about people's perception 
of the Ten Commandments and feeling like it's restrictions and feeling like it's negative. I just, I had this vision in my head of a father and a children. And when you think about the rules that you set for your own kids and everything, like you wouldn't let your five-year-old drive a car, you know? <laughs> or if, if you would, like, you know, I would question your parenting, but... But seriously, though, like, you know, we set up these boundaries and we set up these restrictions because ultimately we love our kids. And that's the same kind of love that the father has for us. And when we sing songs like Run to the Father, like we're about to go into and everything, we got to remember our position in our relationship with God. He is our heavenly father. We are his eternal children. And the reason that these these uh, laws that we talk about in the Old Testament and even some of the uh, some of the laws that we talk about now not only in the Bible but also in the world and everything it's because of boundaries it's because of healthy boundaries and it's because of God's love and making sure that we're taken care of and we're not doing anything that's going to endanger our own lives and I think when we put that kind of perspective and we put that kind of twist on it that you know God's just our father and he's looking out for us as kids you know, what's to be upset about? Like, it's, it's just about keeping us safe, you know? I've carried the burden for too long on my own Cause we weren't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go I see you now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. Run to the Father, fall into grace, done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a searching, my soul needs a friend, so we run to the Father. Had a plan from the start. That's right. Thank you, God. Your son for redemption. The prize for my heart. And I don't have a contest. Searching, so 
to the Father again and again and again and again. that line just as I am Lord you pull me in that's some encouragement it's the kind of encouragement that we don't have to change we don't have to change God's going to love us just the same and it's the love of the father though that encourages us to change it's the love of the father that pulls us away from sin moves us closer to him moves us closer to the life that he has called each and every single one of us to lead. To lead that sinless life. And our example is Jesus. And if you just need to look at something that shows us what kind of life, what kind of desire we should have towards the Father and how to do it, just look at him. Look at Jesus. Turn to him. Love it. So, so good. Father is running to you, yes he is. Oh, as you run to him, the Father runs to you. He wraps you in his grace. He wraps you in his love. He's wrapping you right now. He's wrapping you in his love. It's a supernatural love. our God who is like our God we just worship you God thank you so much thank you God let's just thank him oh we thank you God just lift your voices to him just lift your voices just lift your voices say thank you God thank you God you go thank you God we thank you we lift our voices we lift our hearts thank to you, you Jesus God. thank you God thank you God no one compares no one compares thank you God there's no one like you Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It just rose up in my spirit, First Thessalonians. I love it. It says, this is the will of God for you. Sometimes we think God's will is this big, awesome, you know. But it, God says, no, this is my will for you. And Paul tells us, he says, the will of God for you is to give thanks to give thanks in all circumstances, to give thanks and to rejoice. <laughs> rejoice in your salvation today, no matter what you're facing. That's a word for someone today. Oh, I have so much joy in my heart. And I don't, I don't think it's based on just, I, I'm blessed, yes, but, but there's some things I'm facing. We're all facing something. In spite, in spite, we can say, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you for the everlasting hope. Thank you for the amazing gift of grace and forgiveness. And thank you for the gift of heaven and that we have the Holy Spirit. So you don't have to walk alone. We always say at Venue Church, we're better together. We're better together. Yeah, let's just worship him. Lord of all.
is risen. Yes, he is. Bow down. Bow down before. Bow our hearts to Jesus. For he is Lord, Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Christ, Christ is risen. want to give an opportunity to come to the close of our deeper service. Maybe you're watching and, and you've never received this amazing forgiveness, this amazing grace, this amazing love that we've been just bragging about this morning, just talking about because we're just so excited. We're so excited about this awesome hope. It's just a simple, simple prayer. See, God is, he's presented this amazing gift that's called salvation and, and he bought it for you. And he wants you to have it because he loves you. It's not something you could have worked for, or earned, or even deserved. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. None of us up here deserve it. But God counted you worthy. And he's just waiting for you to surrender and say, yes, God, I want this gift. And I recognize I need something more than I have found in this world. And I need forgiveness. I, I know that I've, I've made mistakes. I know I've broken some of those Ten Commandments. So just say this prayer, it's so simple. Just repeat after me. Just say, God, I receive <laughs> this gift. And I, I put my faith today in what Jesus did for me. I believe that he died on the cross for my sin. And that he was risen on the third day. And I give my life to him today. In Jesus' name, amen. Woo! Let's give it up for all those that just said that prayer. If you said that prayer, we want to know. We care about you. Our team wants to minister to you. You can DM us right here on Facebook or maybe you're on YouTube or on our website. There's a, a connect card. There, just click on connect on our website. You can let us know how we can pray for you or if you want us to reach out. We want you to know that we love you. And what we love to do at Venue is we love to inspire people to follow Jesus and to fall in love with him. So we would love to connect with you. We love you guys so much. Got anything else? <laughs> Got anything else? No, just see you at second service. Thanks for joining us for Deeper today, guys. Love y'all. Love you guys.